If you've been following along with us, we've been walking through Peter's, there she is, we've been walking through Peter's journey with Jesus. We've looked through Peter's two letters that he wrote to the church. We followed his road to redemption over this week, which will culminate on Sunday, but tonight... Tonight we find Peter riddled with guilt and shame for the denial and betrayal of Jesus at his trial. But what's interesting is the worst night of Peter's entire life turned out to be the exact thing that Peter needed the most. A savior willing to lay down his life for him and that's exactly what each of us needs as well. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read this account. Starting in verse 32. Matthew 27, verse 32. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, Well, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires to. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split, and tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, the fact that you went through the scourging, the flogging, the ridicule, the mocking, the jeering, the spitting, and ultimately the crucifixion, all for us. It brings us to a place of solemn grief, of recognition that the nails didn't hold our Savior to the cross, our sins did. Father, tonight use this time to speak to each of us, to draw us deeper into relationship with you to convict us of our sin to call us to repentance that we might be reconciled through the blood of the savior that we might walk in newness of life and feel and appreciate the abundant life that you have purchased for us through your death and resurrection father speak to us tonight call us to yourself in jesus name we pray amen You know, the Bible's very clear 
The Bible's very clear that there is only one path to forgiveness. There's only one road that leads to redemption. The only way to get right with God is through the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Golgotha in Greek or Aramaic translated into Latin and then into English. That's what we mean when we say that Jesus went to Calvary. Literally, he went to the place where all of the heads of the dead crucified by the Romans were piled up. The place that we say and sing about. And yet our society has tried to convince us that, well, you don't really need Jesus. There's all roads lead to God eventually, right? It doesn't matter the path you take. It doesn't matter the, the vehicle that you use to get there. But scripture just simply does not allow that to be true. It does matter because only one road leads to forgiveness. Only one road leads to redemption forgiveness of your sins and that's the road paved by the blood of Jesus it's the only road that will get you where your heart is pitter pattering to arrive at see the reason that Jesus was willing to submit himself to the the torture of human flogging where his skin would have been flayed off of him likely partially emboweled by the time he began to carry his cross the reason he was willing to endure the ridicule of the Romans who wrapped him in a, a purple scarlet robe and laughed at him and spit in his face and called him names and beat him with a rod. The reason that Jesus was willing to go through all of this, the pain, the humiliation that the crucifixion would have been was because he knew it was the only way to pave a path for our redemption. Because Jesus knew that there was no way forward for his people without his bodily sacrifice. Without his death in our place, we would remain condemned for our sins. Guilty before the Father, the judge of the universe. Without death in our place, we would not be restored. He could have called down legions of angels to fight for him. He's a God of the universe. Colossians tells us he's the one who upholds all things by his strength. He could have just opened his mouth and brought the sword forth like he's going to at his second coming. And wiped out all of his enemies at once. Just simply by speaking. But he chose not to. All out of his love for you and for me. You see, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross, it was our sin. My sin nailed him to that tree. My sins and your sins deserve the wrath of God. You see, Romans, Paul tells us in chapter 6 that the wages of sin is death. What we earn, what we deserve because of our shortcomings, because of our rebellion against God, because we haven't lived up to his expectations, because we have turned our backs to him, is eternal separation from the Father for all of eternity. That's what we deserve. But you see, Jesus didn't come down from the cross because we needed him to stay up there. We needed him to die the death that we deserve. He took our place as a, as a substitute. And just like that first Passover in Egypt, the last plague that Moses brought forth before Pharaoh, that first Passover lamb that was killed by each and every family had to be a perfect, spotless, blameless white lamb and it had to be your lamb not your neighbors not your friends it was yours and each family killed that lamb put the blood on the doorpost on the sides of their front door and across the lintel across the top because only by that sacrificial blood painted around the doorpost would the angel of death pass over and save 
the firstborn son. The same thing's true today. Without that Passover lamb, without the the true blood or the, the full blood of the true lamb of God, Jesus is the only way our eternal punishment will pass over us. From the beginning of sin, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, we're shown, we're shown that sin must be atoned for, it must be paid for, it must be covered by blood. That's what the father did when Adam and Eve sinned. The first thing he did was he killed two animals and used their skins to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. Continues in Egypt with the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb. And into the law of Moses where each year one goat would die for the sins of the people. And the other goat would have the high priest's hands laid on its head. As he laid out all the sins of the people of Israel onto this one goat. And then they would take that goat and they would lead it out into the desert. Away from the people and they'd watch it until they couldn't see it any further. And they'd lead the goat to die. You see, sin always has been needed to be atoned for. But in all of these sacrifices and all the rituals throughout the entire Old Testament, they all were pointing forward to a future sacrifice that would actually atone for the people, not just cover it up for a time. All of them were pointing to the fact that sin brings death. It brings separation. And ultimately, our sin must be dealt with, and it must be atoned for. And it eventually was in Jesus. And if you remember, John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29, he points at him, and he tells his disciples who've been following him, he's like, hey, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. See, this Jesus was the one who would become our perfect Passover lamb. He became the fulfillment of the scapegoat. Our sins would be transferred to him, and he would carry them away from us as far as the east is from the west. You see, he's the sacrifice that all these goats and all these lambs and all these bulls and all these doves were sacrificed to represent, to point to. His death on the cross took our sins upon himself and paid the penalty In our place. And like the Passover lamb, Jesus saves us with his blood. Like the covenant sacrifice, he seals us in relationship with his blood. Like the scapegoat, he transfers our sins over to him. And like the sacrificial lamb, he dies in our place. Once and for all, all of our sins are taken away. They are atoned for at the cross. He bore the full weight of the wrath of God destined for you on the cross that first Good Friday. He did it for you. He did it for me. He suffered our separation to to bring about a a restoration, a restoring, a, a fixing of our relationship with the Father. You see, Christ's death, it brings forgiveness Brings forgiveness for our denials of the Father and the Son, just like it did for Peter. That's what Peter was crying out for that first Maundy Thursday night into Friday morning. He's crying out, God, what did I just do? I just denied that I even knew Jesus three times in just a few hours. What is wrong with me? I, I promise that I, I would have went to the grave with him. I would have went to prison with him. I would have laid down my life. And then this little servant girl comes up to me and I fall apart. And I fold and I give in and I lie. And matching eyes with Jesus on that morning broke Peter. But the very place Jesus was going was the very place Peter needed him to go to. Peter needed the forgiveness. 
that only the cross could bring. He needed the forgiveness for his denials after the worst night of his life. And the same thing that was true for Peter is true for you and me as well. You see, Jesus didn't just die for you. He died instead of you. And he did it willingly. And he did it to bring about forgiveness and to make you white as snow, perfectly righteous before the Father. We're going to listen to a song here in just a moment during the Lord's Supper that reminds us why this day is called Good Friday. And I, you know, it is. It's a solemn day. We, we turn the lights down low. We turn up the red. It's a solemn day. Those first disciples, it was not a good Friday for them. And today, as we think about and we reflect on our, our own personal denials of Jesus, the times where we're like, man, I know what I should have done and I didn't do it, but I should have. Or I know I shouldn't have done that and yet ah, I gave into my flesh anyway. And today's a day where we repent of our sins. We remember all that the Lord has done for us. All that he has done to, to bring about our forgiveness. But it's truly only good because we know that Sunday's coming. Because without Sunday, Jesus is just another dead martyr. But the fact of the matter is, is we're lucky to live on this side of that first resurrection Sunday, where we know today is not the end. Friday's not the end. It's just the means to the end. An end where we willingly lay down our lives for our Savior, knowing that when we die to self, we find true life. It's both spiritually true as well as it's physically true as well. For those who've surrendered to the lordship of Jesus at our physical death, we will enter into his presence. We will be with him for all of eternity in glory. It will be awesome. It's going to be the best day of your, well, you won't be alive, but the best day of your life. And when we look back, the best day that we had in this world, the best day it will not even begin to compare to the worst day in heaven, in the face to face with the sun. But you see, this is also true spiritually. You see, when you come to the cross, you have to come to a realization. You have to come to the place where you recognize and you acknowledge that you cannot save yourself. Because if you come to the cross saying, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm most of the way there. If God really weighed my good and my bad, my good would outweigh my bad, he'd probably let me in. So I'm just doing this for insurance purposes. To the just in case. If that's what you come to the cross with, then you're not coming to the cross with the right heart. You see, when you come to the cross, you must come saying, I have nothing good to bring. I have nothing that is worthy of your acknowledgement, of your forgiveness, of your love, of your mercy. I am stained with sin. My robes are filthy nasty. And you should not let me into your presence. I am unworthy to even lay down before you, God. That's how you come to the cross. That's how, G that's how Peter came to the cross recognizing how broken and sinful he truly was. When you come to the cross, you must come with the realization that you cannot save yourself. You don't have the strength, you don't have the goodness to do so. And you must acknowledge the totality of your sinfulness and throw yourself on the mercy of God and say, God, if only for the fact that you are faithful to your son, if only for the fact that Jesus poured out his life for me, that is the only reason that I can stand before you. And when you do that, Paul says that we die to ourselves. 
We are crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. We lay down our lives. We die to our old ways, our old desires, our old sinful practices, our old passions. And that's the spiritual death that we find new life in. And it's at that moment when we finally open our hands and say, God, all that I have is yours. Nothing that I have is good in me. God, I give it all to you. The old is gone, the new has come, and we're amazed as God in his faithfulness and his goodness and his mercy says, you're forgiven because of what my son has done on the cross. And we find the abundant life as our our weight of burden of guilt and shame are lifted off and transferred to Jesus. We find that his yoke is truly light, that his ways are actually best. And it's true that the road to redemption, it's not easy. It's not always comfortable. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trials. Those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, Paul told Timothy, his beloved child in the faith. Jesus said, many of you will be mocked and beaten and even die for your allegiance to him. Just like his apostles. Only one lived to old age and he did so after being boiled in oil and left on an island of Patmos to die. And yet God did not allow him to. Peter, the man we've been walking with, was crucified upside down in Rome by Emperor Nero because he refused to be crucified right side up because he said he's not not good enough, he should not be able to die in the same manner as his Savior. You see, but the hope that we have is that we know that this life isn't the best there is. This isn't eternal. It's temporary. We're only here for Maybe 60, 70, 80, 90 years if you're really unlucky, lucky, however you want to put it. And then we spend eternity somewhere else. This world's a shadow of what's coming. And as we read this book, we know where the road leads to. We know who's standing at the finish line, waiting to wrap his ever-loving arms around us. You see, Jesus understands. He knows. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 tell us that Jesus sympathizes with us in our weakness. He's a great high priest. He gets it. He understands. There's nothing in this world that he has not been through and knows how hard it is. He's been tempted in every way that we are, and yet he is without sin. He knows exactly what you're going through. He feels your suffering. He feels your pain, your difficulties, the struggles that you're wrestling with as you wake up in the morning and as you put your head down on the pillow at night. He knows your trials. He knows your temptations. He knows the pain of loss. He knows the weight of guilt And how it eats at you. He knows your hardships. He he knows your afflictions. He knows your persecutions. The just and the unjust ones alike. See, Jesus was abandoned by those closest to him. He was betrayed by someone he walked with for three and a half years. And slept next to night after night after night. And poured his life into. He was mocked and wrongly accused. He was humiliated and spit on. He was forsaken and he was rejected. He was beaten and he was executed. You see, Jesus gets it. He understands the difficulties you're walking through. And he sees you and he wants you. And just like God's response to Moses in Exodus, he hears your pleas for help. He sees your afflictions. 
and he is willing to deliver you. He's already done the work necessary to do it. He's already done what it will take to redeem you, to restore you, to forgive you. You see, this path, it, it wasn't paved by Peter. It was paved by Jesus' blood. And it's the blood of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. It's His atoning sacrifice that makes us righteous. And it's that act of absolute, unbelievable, divine love that we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. And on that last Thursday night, Jesus' last Passover meal he had with his disciples, as he took the bread and broke it, he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. And he took the third cup, and he drank it and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for, for, for the forgiveness of sins. And as many times as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death. You proclaim the gospel. You see, the Lord's Supper is something beautiful. It's a visual picture of the gospel in action. As we recognize that Christ's body was broken for us. And that his blood was poured out for our forgiveness. And when we eat the bread and we drink the, the juice, that's what we're proclaiming. We're preaching it with our actions. We're not using words per se. We're using our body to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And we're going to do communion a little bit different tonight. We have four stations. There's two in the back and two in the front in the four corners. And tonight... I invite you to, to come as a family or individuals or friends, come up together. There will be a couple at each of the tables to pray for you, over you, if you want. If you have something that you're wrestling with and, and you, you just need somebody to, to pray for you in that, I encourage you to, to use this time. If, if you don't know what you need prayed for, but you just feel that nudging in your, in your chest. Just say, hey, I don't, know, I don't know what, but will you just pray for me? If there's something you're like, man, this has been eating at me, and I need to repent of this. I need to bring this to the cross. I need to bring this to the altar of Christ so that it can be done away with and removed from me. It's a good opportunity. James, in his, gospel, in his epistle, writes, to, to bring your needs before the elders of the church and to have them pray over you for the, the prayers of a righteous man avail much. And so I encourage you. I encourage you to use it if you feel led. If you don't, that's perfectly fine. You can walk up, grab the bread, eat it together, grab the juice, drink it together, and then you can return to your seat. As we start here, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to have a, a music video going on the screens, to, to begin to get our hearts right. And remember, the reason we do this is because Friday is not the end. The reason we celebrate this meal is because we know that Sunday's coming. And that's a beautiful thing of hope. So couples uh, who, who are uh, going to be praying, will you guys head to your tables, please? And I'd encourage you, as you feel led, to go ahead and walk to one of the four stations and partake of the body of the Lord and the bread or the